over and make sure you're, you're good, right? Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rob Osolinski, and uh, on behalf of uh, Gibson as well as Bailey Brothers, we appreciate you all coming out this morning. Uh, really excited to have a great day talking about Gibson Acoustic with everyone. Um, fortunately for you, I'm not the one that's going to be doing all the talking because uh, all the way from Bozeman, Montana, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Don Rafato. Many of you know Don uh, and have uh, met him before, but he's the Senior Product Specialist for Gibson, Montana, again, coming from, from Bozeman. And, and I would add to his job description, he's the overall Goodwill Worldwide Ambassador uh, for Gibson Acoustic. So he does a great job. He's brought some special guitars just for this event today. So he'll talk about those and then encourage you also to come by and give them a test drive after Don's uh, done talking. So um, you want to hear from him rather than me, but I just want to take a moment and say thank you for coming out and introduce Don Rafato. Well, thanks again. Thank you, Rob, and thank all of you for coming down this morning. Some of you I've met before. Some of you have heard my little spiel before, but we're going to talk about some new things that are going on, too. I'd like to thank all my friends and you too, Danny, for coming down today. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's good to see familiar faces. Gibson is, of course, a very historic company, but always changing, always innovating. We're going to be talking a little bit about the history. I've, some of you have maybe heard some of this before, but I'm still just going to kind of reiterate kind of where we got to today and how we got to where we are today and, and how we utilize the, the technologies that are available to make our product better without taking anything away from the historic nature of how we build the guitars and what the guitars are all about. Uh, just a brief overview, of course, Gibson started in 1894 by Orville Gibson. He really wasn't involved with the company very long, to be honest with you. It was shortly after he would became just a consultant, and it wasn't many years when he was gone from the company altogether. But his innovations that he created are still the basis for what we do today and how the guitar guitars are constructed. In Kalamazoo, Michigan, of course, for decades and decades in Kalamazoo, they built everything from the arch tops, the banjos, the electric guitars, the, the acoustic guitars, uh, mandolins, dobros, not dobros, I should say mandolins. In the 70s, 60s and 70s, went through some really tough times. And Gibson, at one point in time, was purchased by a company called Norlin. And I've used this analogy a lot. It was kind of like when AMF bought Harley. They didn't know anything about the product, didn't care about the quality of the product so much as it was just a bottom line thing. The guitars were not that great. There were some great guitars made through all the eras of Gibson, but in some of these times, it's just the consistency wasn't there. Every guitar wasn't as good as it should have been. And because of that, the business you know, faltered, suffered heavily. One of the things that they did at that time is they thought that by moving to Nashville, it would bring some life back to the company. And because Nashville being Music City was a little bit more hip than Kalamazoo, so to speak. Uh, and, and it was. It worked. They moved down there, and it, it took them a while to kind of get things going. But one of the problems they had not thought about was climate, humidity. We've talked about this before in my, in my past visits here. It's even with today's technology, when it's 80, 90 percent humidity outside, there's nothing you can do about it. In Montana, we can pump it in. It's, it gets a little dry, but when it's like that, there's not much you can do. They couldn't get the woods to acclimate. With solid body guitars, with arch top guitars, it's not that big of a deal. But, you know, the sides on these guitars average about 95 thousandths of an inch thick. The tops and backs are about 110 thousandths of an inch thick. If the wood is not acclimated properly, if the wood isn't dried to a point where it's stable, those guitars aren't going to hold up. Uh, Norlin tried building acoustic guitars in Nashville, and like I said, they built some nice guitars, but just the consistency wasn't there. In the early 80s, uh, the company was really suffering and on the verge of almost going away. It was, it was to that point when our current ownership, Dave Berryman and Henry Juskowitz, saw what people were paying for the vintage stuff, saw what the passion people had for the old Gibson guitars, and said, you know, all we got to do is get close. All we got to do is recreate some of this magic, and it's a viable company. And 
they bought everything that was Gibson and Epiphone, the factories, the inventories, the woods, the copyrights, the intellectual properties, everything for $5 million. And sounds like a lot of money, but when you think of it, that's like one day's production for our company now. And, and they got, and people laughed at them and they said, well, you know, we just need to come close on this stuff and people will buy it. They started with the Les Paul, built the Les Paul, recreated some of that and, and consumers and store owners and retailers said, yeah, you know, this is better than it's been. They got a ways to go, but it's just, it's kind of got some momentum going. And they too tried building acoustic guitars in Nashville and had the same problems. Uh, through the mid to late 80s, there, there's some great guitars, but some of them, a lot of them just didn't hold up because the wood wasn't climatized properly. There was a little mandolin manufacturer that had started in Bozeman in the late 70s called Flatiron Mandolins. And they were making some great mandolins to the point where they were competing with the Gibson mandolin, so we couldn't have that. So we bought that company to eliminate the competition. And because Henry saw the quality of the mandolins they were building in Bozeman, he thought, man, maybe they could do some guitars up there. So Ren Ferguson, who some of you have met here at Bailey Brothers, who was our master luthier for, for many, many, many years in Bozeman and a renowned guitar maker, was working with Flatiron, and, and Henry and Dave said, you know, Ren, build a couple acoustic guitars. He did. They liked what they saw, so they built a few more. And in 1987, we broke ground on our factory in Bozeman. In 89, we shipped our first guitars out of Montana. And the first years were rough. We just, it took us a while to get people trained, get good management in place, just to learn how to build guitars. Because no one from Kalamazoo relocated to Bozeman. Very few people from Kalamazoo relocated to Nashville because they were happy where they were. And they actually started a company called Heritage Guitars, which are still built in the old Gibson factory in Kalamazoo to this day. So we basically started with the mandolin crew and a bunch of people that had never built guitars before. And it took a while. And it actually got to the point where we went through a, f a fair number of managers and just the learning curve was tricky in the mid eight, in the mid nineties. Uh, Henry, who owns the company, sent up a team from Nashville and, and literally said, fix it or shut it down. I'm not going to just keep throwing money at, the, at this Montana thing. And they actually did the job. From that time on, the guitars have gotten better. They've gotten more consistent. Um, I always like to say that that's the time I started working for Gibson, but I think that's just a coincidence that that's when the turnaround happened too. But I've been with the company for over 20 years up in Bozeman. Uh, started out sand and wood like everybody else. Worked my way through a lot of different positions. And uh, so I've, it's, it's fun. I've seen a lot of the changes and got a really good feel for where the guitars are today. And I can honestly say that, and I hear it from Keith, from Clay Bailey, from customers all over the country, that the stuff we're building right now is more consistent and better than anything we've ever made. Now, wood is wood. Every guitar is different. You can pick up a guitar and say, well, this isn't, you know, like the one I played yesterday at a different shop. And that's, that's the case, of course, because every guitar is hand-built. But when you find that one you like, it is truly the only guitar like that in the whole world, just because of the amount of handwork that, that goes into these Gibson acoustics. We're going to talk a little bit about how we build the guitars and what makes us unique. Not better, not worse, but different than our, than our main competition. And I do some comparisons with... Martin, Taylor, Gibson, kind of considered the big three. All three companies make fantastic instruments. All three companies have a little different mindset on how to build guitars and what works for them may not work for us, what works for us may not work for them, but we feel that the way we build guitars works best to get to that historic sound, that historic feel, and to stay true to our roots and build the guitars the way they've always been built. have some parts and pieces. The one thing that's really cool about the Gibson acoustic line as compared to a lot of our competition is you can start with our J15, which is our, our lowest price guitar, all the way through some of our custom high-end limited edition pieces. And one thing that you can be guaranteed is every guitar is built exactly the same. The only differences in these guitars besides the obvious body shapes and sizes and colors is materials and ornamentation and the number of man hours it takes to put those packages together. How the guitars are constructed are 100% identical on every guitar. And there's four things that we do. Those of you that have been through this before, I know it's a little bit of a reiteration, but it's very important that, that you understand this about the Gibson acoustics. 
First off, even though they're called flat top guitars, all of our guitars have a 28 foot radius top. It's made, the top, the, the bracing is actually cut in an arc. All the braces are, so when you put, so when you glue the top on, it holds it in a dome. Now what does that do? Compared to a true flat top guitar, it creates tension. How a guitar creates sound is every time you hit a note, the top actually moves, it deflects. That's what helps create the sound. The strings cause that effect to the top. The trick is, with a true flat top guitar, there's no tension. You hit a note, the top moves. You hit the next note, it's not ready for it. It's not gonna react exactly the same. Now these tops move, it's microscopic, it happens in a millisecond, but when you build that tension into a dome top, you hit a note, it moves, but it's back. It's ready for the next note. So even when you strum through all six strings, every note is defined. And that just gives that clarity that you don't get out of a non-traditionally built guitar. Now again, there's a lot of great guitars out there. They don't all build them this way, and they sound great. It's a wonderful thing, but to get the true traditional Gibson sound, we believe in these attributes that we do. So you have your dome top, creates tension, kind of like a speaker cone. Every time that bass note hits, you see the speaker cone move, same concept. And we also, we scallop off the bracing to make this top as light as possible so it responds to the string vibration, which is what creates sound. Every Gibson guitar has this. I'm gonna pass this around so you guys can take a look at it. One of the questions I get asked a lot when I'm traveling is, why can your competition, uh, basically across the board, why can they put guitars out on the market at those lower price points? Why can Martin and Taylor, I'm gonna use those just as examples as the big three, why can they have an $800 guitar on the wall and Gibson doesn't? Well, a lot of it is because we don't want to compromise the way we build guitars just to get to a price point. One of the things that has been developed over the years to allow guitars to be built more efficiently is a bolt-on neck. It's a wonderful thing. You can bolt the neck on, you can take it off, shim it, sand it, do what you need to do to make that guitar's playability as perfect as possible. No one doubts the consistency of, of a tailor's playability. Everyone you pick up plays great. That bolt-on neck, you can just get it set exactly where you want it to be. The downside, I mean, there's not much wood to the body of a guitar. When you can take the neck and make it a part of the instrument that's creating sound, instead of just an attachment to it that's holding the strings, that's what gives a traditionally built Gibson, a traditionally built Martin, that roundness of tone, that historic sound that you don't get out of a modern built guitar. We use a dovetail neck joint on every guitar we make. It's the highest learning curve job in the entire factory, because these guys that, that do this, and there's only a few people that we allow to do this job, they put that neck on and look down and go, okay, it looks like this now, but what's gonna happen with 200 pounds of string tension? Because it's gonna move. And they have to be able to visualize where it is now versus where it's gonna be once it's strung up because this guitar has to go through the entire finish process before we know if it's done right. So they have to be right a pretty high percentage of the time or we're not gonna be around very long. We take it one step further. On every neck joint, we use what's called hide glue. Before there were wood glues, before there were super glues, they used a, a, a hot horse hide glue, which is basically horse hide that's been, it's granulated, when you heat it back up, it turns into this gooey, sticky mess. But that's what we used to make the old mandolins, the old violins, before there were modern glues. It transfers vibration better than any other adhesive. It crystallizes, gets super hard. When you strum a traditionally built guitar with the, neck, with the dovetail neck joint and hide glue, you can feel the vibration up here. You don't get that out of a non-traditionally built guitar. You've got a lot of wood working for you here that you don't have otherwise. The dovetail neck joint is something that, again, it's, it's difficult to do, but we just really feel that it's that important that we hope we never have to change that part of the building process. You got your dome top, you got your hot high glue dovetail neck joint. Another way that builders have found to more economically build acoustic guitars and all guitars is something that's been developed over the past couple decades. It's UV poly finishes. It's a wonderful thing. You spray the UV poly finish on the guitar, you put it under a UV light, and literally five minutes later, it's hard as glass, looks wonderful, and it's, 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 a, it's a great thing. But it will never change. It will never mature. 
it will it's it's almost like a plexiglass coating on the guitar and there's nothing wrong with that but there's a reason why the old Gibsons the old Martins the old guilds the old Epiphones sound the way they do it's not just because they're old it's because they were built in a manner that they could get better and better with time and that is the lacquer the nitrocellulose lacquer we use, it's literally getting thinner and thinner for decades. It's dissipating into the atmosphere. It's getting absorbed into the wood. As that happens, the guitar is allowed to breathe, allowed be, to be freed up, to vibrate. You can't build 40 years into a guitar. You can own 40, 50 years. You can only build the guitar in a manner that it can become that vintage guitar. And the biggest part about that is the lacquer. Again, we're not the only people that still use nitro lacquer, but we are the only major manufacturer that uses it on every guitar we make. So that's three things that we do across the board. The dome top, dovetail neck joint with high glue, the nitro lacquer. The most important thing is these guitars are, are truly handmade still to this day. We do more handwork than any other major manufacturer. Every neck is hand sanded to its final shape. Every piece of wood is hand sanded to final thickness, hand assembled. We use uh, CNC's to rough cut the necks, but once it gets beyond that, every part is hand assembled. Every burst is hand sprayed. It's amazing. The sunburst you see in there, if you look, and even up here on stage, they're all a little bit different. That's just because you have people doing this. It's not robotics. The lacquer is all put on by hand. It's no, again, the other, our competition uses robotic sprayers, robotic buffers, hand sprayed, hand buffed, hand colored. Every guitar is a little bit different. Some people say, well, they're not consistent. We like to just say, no, every guitar has its own personality. When you find that guitar you like, it's the only guitar like that in the whole world. And so if you get one of those in your hands and you say, wow, this is really cool, don't let it get away. Because if someone else buys it, you will never find a guitar like that again if it says Gibson on the peg head. And when we really take pride in that handwork and in that individuality of each instrument. Those are the four things that we just really feel strongly about. And again, we talked about price points and, and how we can't get to a lot of our comp competitors' price points. We don't want to. That race to the bottom is a slippery slope, and we don't want to get caught up in that and change the way we build guitars just to, just to get to a, a spot price point-wise. We're, we're very happy with the product that we make now where we're at, and we're selling everything we're building. And we have a great team right now that's just doing a great job for us hand building every Gibson acoustic guitar. Any questions on construction? Anybody have anything, any comments or on that part of the game? All right, let's talk a little bit about the guitars. At any time, please feel free to, to interrupt me. Let me know if you have any questions or just want to make any comments about Gibsons or just guitars in general. Back in the day, pretty much back in... <laughs> Into the 20s, all instruments were small. Basically, mandolins were the instruments that everyone played. Uh, Martin made guitars from like the mid-1800s, but all their guitars were small body guitars. Gibson's first guitars that were flat, that were built in this style came out in the mid-20s. Small body guitars, L1s, L00s, that type of thing. It was a, it was a new thing for us, but people just kind of went crazy over it and it changed the way people thought about guitars, the way people thought about Gibson. To this day, we make quite a variety of small body guitars, great finger style guitars, great blues guitars. This is a limited edition Adirondack Red Spruce L00. We only made 65 of these for worldwide distribution. Uh, one thing I love about Bailey Brothers, they love getting the cool stuff and they always do. Right, Danny? Danny has a few himself. Linda has a bunch too, so. But it's just a wonderful. The nice thing about the small body Gibsons that are made historically, they just have a warmth and a roundness of tone that you don't get out of a lot of small body guitars. A lot of small body guitars can be tighter, a little bit crisper, but this is like just a wonderful tonality. Resonance is beautiful. Small body guitars were just were all Gibson made from the 20s into the 30s. Uh, moving forward into the 40s, we made guitars that were like the B25, the LG2, slightly bigger. And uh, to this day, this, uh, this the L00 is still our biggest selling small body guitar. 
One guitar that we started making a few years ago was the 1937 LOO Legend. And we thought, okay, we made a couple models that we thought would be kind of cool to replicate an old guitar. But we learned the hard way that it's really hard to make people happy when you do that because we made a 37 LOO Legend and we made it as perfect as we thought we could do it. And, you know, people came out of the woodwork saying, well, my 37's not like that and my 37's different. And Gibson's always kind of been all over the map. In our history, is un in given years, there's a lot of variations on the same model, and that's just kind of the nature of being a wacky company like we are. And so one thing we've learned is now we kind of don't do so much year-specific as, as, say, like the vintage things, which we'll talk about. It's just called a vintage, and it's kind of a throwback to a time. The one thing that we do, though, when we do want to replicate a specific year, we find a guitar. And we have, there's a collector in North, in North Carolina called, uh, named Gary Burnett who does a lot of the guitar shows, the Spartanburg show, the Charleston show, and he has just an incredible collection. And we went and actually replicated some of his guitars, which was a cool thing because he's the only one that could call us out on it if it wasn't done right. So we, we took his guitar collection, we replicated some of those guitars, we sent him the prototypes, and he said, well, change this, this, and this on a couple. And when we got his blessing, we thought, okay, this is a replica of a 1932. And, and so we were able to do that in a way that didn't open us up to quite as much scrutiny. Those, those forum guys have way too much time on their hands and, and love to find things to, to complain about. And so we try to, try to take that off their plate as much as possible. But the small body Gibsons, small body guitars right now are very, very popular. The, the Martin double O's and OM's just do incredibly well. This, the L double O's work well for us. We make a 1928 L1. Blues reissue, it's kind of like the old Robert Johnson blues guitar, which is just a wonderful, wonderful instrument. Keith had one, but he sold it, so I don't have one to show you here today. But if you are a finger picker or just a smaller person, we'd love to have you try out the variety of small body guitars that they have in the acoustic room today. Rob, myself, Jeff Sprayberry, all from Gibson will be here to help answer any questions. I do want to talk a second about what we are doing today. Before you leave, make sure you get signed up for our giveaway. We are giving away two $500 coupons off the sale price on any Gibson acoustic guitar in stock. And you have up to a month to redeem it, so you don't have to decide today. Uh, we're going to do one of them for, we're going to do the drawings at 5 o'clock. One of them is, must be present to win, but the other one isn't. So if you can't be here at 5, you still have a chance to win one of the two, one of the two coupons. And again, it's $500 off the sale price on any Gibson acoustic in stock. It's a chance to get a great guitar at the best price you'll, you'll ever get. So just make sure you, you get signed up for that before you head out today. If you don't think that you are in the market to use it, respectfully, maybe just let the sign-up be for people that will, but we hope everyone would sign up and take advantage of it because, again, it's, it's the best price you will ever get on one of our guitars. So in the 20s and 30s, you had this size. Early 30s, you had small-body guitars. In 1934... Gibson introduced what was called the Jumbo. And it was basically this type of guitar. It was this size of guitar. It was the biggest guitar Gibson had ever made. Nowadays, you know, you wouldn't consider this a Jumbo, but that is what the, where the J came from. The J, uh, original Jumbo in 34, 1935, the Advanced Jumbo became available. The J35 also was introduced in 1935. And does anyone know why it was called the J35? It cost 35 bucks. When the J45 was introduced to the market, it cost 45 bucks. The J200 was $200. That's how Gibson priced their instruments in, in the early days. But the slope shoulder dreadnought just took off like crazy for us. We had some variations through the 30s, but in 1942, Gibson introduced the J45. Uh, this guitar has been our biggest selling guitar every year since 1942. And those of you that have played them just, they just work. Balance, warm, short scale, easy to play, uh, just a classic Gibson look. Uh, just a fun guitar, just a fun guitar. We've made a lot of variations over the years. Uh, moving forward, you know, from the wartime, there was a lot of variations there just because of materials, limitations and such. Went through the Kalamazoo years, went through the New Orleans years. We got to Bozeman, Montana, and... You know, basically we looked at it and said, okay, this guitar has morphed into something different from the original 1942 version. 
And we looked at a whole line across the board and said, you know, these are basically modern versions of Gibson acoustic guitars. So at that time, we said, let's just, let's do this. Let, let's not pretend that these are vintage instruments. We, the first ones were called modern classics, but now it's just called the J45 standard. This is what's available today as our standard 45. It's the best 45 we've ever made, but it's not period correct, so to speak. And we're not trying to do that. The neck has been slimmed down from the original ones. Yes, Danny? <laughs> I'm sure you would. <laughs> the neck has been slimmed down for the modern player. Uh, we went with the Grover tuners, the more modern logo on the peg head. We put a pickup in it these days. We use bags pickups in almost all of our guitars. Our vintage replica guitars, which we'll talk about, we don't put any pickups in because we want them to be like the originals. But we've kind of morphed to the bags electronics for the very reason that they replicate the sound of the guitar. It doesn't just sound like a loud acoustic guitar. You put this pickup in this J45 and plug it in, it still sounds like this guitar. You put it in that hummingbird, it sounds like that hummingbird. And to us, that's important because people buy the guitar for what that guitar is. And when you plug it in, you don't want that to change. So we are using bags, LR bags pickup systems almost across the board with only one exception where we still use Fishman. Fishman makes great stuff, but we just find that the bags pickups work better for the Gibson acoustics. But uh, for 2016, one of the things that we did on across the board too is we upgraded from just the single volume control inside to a new system that Lloyd Bags developed for us that has a volume and tone control. So just a little added benefit so you can you know roll off the highs or roll up the lows, whatever you like, without having to go to the amplifier. The other, it, there's no really tonal differences from the ones with the volume control. So if you see that, it's still a great setup, great unit. This just has a little bit more added functionality for 2016. So you have your J45, modern version, it's a great thing. One of the things though, there's still that guy that goes, oh man, I wish I had that guitar that my, that my grandpa had, or that one that I let get away, that I had when I was in college. And we know there's a market for those people out there. So, we introduced a line of guitars a few years ago, it's called the True Vintage Line, and for this year, they're called just the Vintage Line. This is a throwback piece and you've got to play one of these. There's two of them in there and this one. They're basically, like I said, they're not year specific, but they're a throwback to the time. Visually, you've got the script and banner, you've got the tuners, the old style tuners. You've got the VOS rubbed finish, so it's not shiny and new looking. No electronics, it comes in a really cool period correct case. The whole package is really cool, but the best thing about this is. <laughs> Isn't that just wonderful? Now, one of the things that we did this year, other, other manufacturers for a while have been utilizing a technology called torification. Does anyone know what that is? Torified tops. A few people out there. One thing that's always been a mystery is why do the old guitars sound the way they do? What change? What, what makes them different? And technology over the past decade has allowed them to study the old pieces of wood to a cellular level and see what is different between an old piece of wood and a new piece of wood. Okay, so now they've, they've identified the visual differences and the, you know, at a, at a cellular level, what is different about it? How can we get there quicker? They came up with a process called torification that expedites that. It takes the wood, and different companies do it different ways. We are utilizing the University of Minnesota in Duluth, who's been doing wood research for, for decades up there in the north woods of Minnesota, and they've been doing some, some work on this, and we basically hired them to do our research, and they are now actually torrifying the tops on our vintage guitars. It's put in a, a kiln, per se, but it has to be a kiln in, in a vacuum, because it heats the wood to like well over 200 degrees, and if there's any oxygen, it'll just burst into flame. So it has to be in a vacuum, it draws all the moisture out, just makes it light, makes it just stiffer, and the sound is just. It sounds like an old guitar. And if, before you leave, you gotta pick this up. It is just featherweight. It's amazing what it does. So we are utilizing the thermally aging technology in our vintage line, and we're doing four guitars that have this in it now. We, we do the 45 standard and we do the 45 vintage. The same with the Hummingbird. We do a standard version and a, and a vintage version, an L00 and an L1, two small body guitars. So if you have the opportunity, again, we're not the first people to do this. Uh, Martin, Taylor, Yamaha, Bourgeois, they've been doing it. We're kind of the last people to the party, but we kind of wanted to 
in some ways, I guess, learn from their mistakes, learn from their uh, research, and, and just take it to the next level. And we think our guitars, it really fits in well, just because of the historic nature of our guitars. And then you add this dynamic to it, makes it sound like an old Gibson, and it's a really wonderful thing. So I hope you take the opportunity to try it. We get into the 60s, and Gibson introduces the Hummingbird, 1960. It's kind of a folky thing, kind of a love and peace kind of guitar. It has that look. What amazes me is literally since 1960 when this guitar was, was, was introduced to the market, other than the J45, this has been our second biggest selling guitar. You know, it's got a pretty unique look. The pick guard, the color, it's, it's, you know, you would think that that would limit the market to this guitar, but it's amazing and it's just because it works. I was final inspector at the Gibson Acoustic Factory for almost two and a half years and during that time I literally played pretty much every Gibson guitar made during that time period. And every day, I'd, that time we were doing like 50 guitars a day and I'd just tune up the guitar when it came to me and I'd strum and hit a chord. And it was amazing how often on any given day my favorite guitar was a hummingbird. I know a lot of that's personal preference, but they just, the reason that they're successful and the reason that we haven't changed them is just this combination of what we call a square shoulder dreadnought, which is almost more like a little bit more of a Martin type body style. It's a short scale, like a 45, the woods, the mahogany, the spruce, it's just. It works, I don't. But <laughs> it's just a, just a wonderful, wonderful representation of the 60s and Gibson. A lot of people ask, what's the difference between a hummingbird and a dove? Because they're both very traditional guitars from the same time period. Uh, doves, well, the two main differences. The dove is maple, whereas a, a traditional hummingbird is rosewood. And the dove has the long scale, 25 and, th and a half inch scale, where this is 24 and 3 quarters. The dove is more made for the guy that's going to be... The it was originally introduced for the country guy that's going to be strumming. This was the guitar that was made for the folk guy that's going to do the finger style, thus the short scale. The mahogany reacts a little better to the lighter touch playing. But st structurally, the bodies are exactly the same, but a lot of some visual differences. But anyway, that's just a little sidebar there because I, mean, I get asked that question a bunch. The Hummingbird works great. Once again, the modern version has a pickup, Grover tuners, uh, there is a vintage version in the acoustic room that you got to play. That also has the thermally aged top, the, the torrified, so to speak, top. And if you play them side by side, you really will appreciate what that process does to the instrument. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, we do put a premium on those because it is a lot of, is, there's a lot of expense involved in getting that, those tops done that way. That guitar also comes in a period correct brown case, which is really cool. But the Hummingbird just works. One of the things, and just another side note on where we are not afraid to get away from our history just a little bit to, to satisfy the modern player and, and people like yourself, one of the things that happened with a lot of the hummingbirds from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and you've seen this, the pickguard design sometimes would wear off from people just playing it because it was like either a hot stamped or a hand painted thing. So we thought, okay, this is the modern version of this guitar. Let's make everything a little better. We found a company that created a pick guard that actually has a 60,000 sheet of clear over the design. So from three feet away, it looks just like the original, but it's impervious. It will never wear off. So that's just the kind of things that we always look to use technology that's available to make things a little better. Yes, ma'am. No. We have done variations, of course. We, you know, over the years, we've pretty much tried everything at least once, and we've done limited runs of, of doves and hummingbirds in rosewood. But as part of the product main product line, no, don't know why. Uh, we've done rosewood. We did a guitar called the J60 a few years back, and that was a square shoulder rosewood guitar, and it really just didn't catch on. I think that it was maybe too much, it was, we made it to kind of go after that Martin D28 guy, and those guys are going to buy Martin D28s, you know, so there's no sense in, in going after a client base that isn't yours, you know, we have a hummingbird, they don't, they have a D28, we don't, so we just kind of stick with your strength, so to speak, so we've kind of stayed away from the rosewood s square shoulder guitar for that very reason. 
going to take a step even back in time now, 1937. All the guitars were small. We had just introduced what we called the jumbo, the dreadnoughts. But still, there wasn't anything, a big guitar out there. There was this cowboy singer named Ray Whitley, who was at that time as famous as Gene Autry, Roy Rogers, all those guys. And he was famous. He performed at Grand Ole Opry, performed all over the country. And he came to Gibson with a problem. He says, you know, he goes, we have one microphone on the stage. I've got background singers. I've got a full band. No one can hear my guitar. I need a big guitar. So Gibson dug around. And at that point in time, they were making big arch tops in Nashville. And so they took one of the arch top molds, which is 17 inches, and created the J200 for Ray Whitley. And he just loved the guitar. And the story goes that he's, you know, those guys always dressed up fancy outfits. He said, and I want it to be flashy. I want it to be as flashy as my jacket, so to speak. And that's what the quote is anyway. And so Gibson introduced the J200. It was the biggest guitar ever made to that point. And it's still just known as kind of our, our mainstay, the most, probably the most visual, along with the Hummingbird, of course. But when you see this, you know it's a Gibson. You know it's a J200. And started off as kind of a country guitar, but the rockers just loved it. Through the 60s and 70s, Pete Townsend, George Harris, and Bob Dylan, they've all used J200s because you can just, the thing about a guitar this big, and especially one that's made out of maple, which is very dense, with a guitar like a 45 or any other a, any other standard size acoustic guitar, you hit it so hard they just kind of start compressing. They'll only get so loud because they can only push so much air. But the thing about this guitar, the harder you hit it, the louder it goes, and it really doesn't break up. It doesn't change. It doesn't, you know, with it doesn't compress, so to speak. And that's why country guys and, and rockers just love this guitar because you can just beat the crap out of it and it'll it'll bite you right back. And it's a wonderful thing. We've made a lot of variations of the 200s over the years. They have some custom shop pieces in there, including a Western classic, which is pretty close to the original Ray Whitley without as much ornamentation as his had. But if you want to play one that's a really nice representation of the very original J200, there's one hanging in the wall in there. Beautiful guitar. J200s, of course, also, we, this is the modern version of the guitar with a pickup system, with the pick guard that won't wear off, with the Grover tuners. And we do variations of this. Right now we're doing the Bob Dylan signature model, which is kind of a throwback with the uh, Godel type tuners and, and the uh, hand-painted pick guards. Uh, just a quick note, we did a run of guitars for Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan has never done a signature model guitar ever for anybody. Very difficult to work with, to say the least. He's a little quirky. And uh, it took us almost 10 years to get this done to get the contract signed, to get he wanted to design the guitars. The only reason that we even got it done was because we had one of our entertainment relations people that lived across the street from his personal manager and was good friends. Uh, the Martin worked with him for almost a decade and walked away because he just was impossible, and he still is. But the funny thing is we, we made 175 signed ones, and we, those sold out in a day and a half, and they were had a street price of 10 grand. And they're just beautiful guitars. So the crazy thing is we sent Bob 175 labels to sign for the inside of the guitar. And he signed 175 labels in pencil and sent them back to us. So it was just, we looked at that and went, oh, geez. So we, we spray-sealed them. We weren't going to go back to the well and say, can you redo these in pen? But uh, so we sealed them and just shipped them out. And did you have, have any of those here, Keith? Did you ever get one? Uh, not the signed one. And... Uh, but the, what we are also making for the person that's a Dylan fan that wants a guitar he can actually play, we make what's called the Player's Edition. It's not quite as ornate. It's more like a, a vintage J200 than a, than a showpiece, so to speak. And that's kind of the vintage version of the 200 that we're doing right now with an Adirondack top and, and vintage tuners and such. But the Dylan Project, it's, uh, it, it was quite an adventure. We learned a lot from that. But the J200, again, just a fantastic guitar. Works great. And... Uh, is something that's very unique and if you've never played one you got to give yourself the opportunity it is a big guitar it's not for everybody i get a lot of people say you know playing sitting down and even uh, i'm not a big guy and but th it's a sound you can only get out of a big guitar if you want that sound that's just the only way to get it. it's right here we have some modern guitars those of you that are familiar with our lineup are familiar with the guitar called the songwriter which keith has a few of in there 
Uh, in the, I, I didn't have room for everything up here, unfortunately, but we can, if you want, I can show you in there, you can try it out. In the mid-90s, when we were just getting our feet wet in Montana, our guitars weren't as consistent as we would like them to be. It just took a while, as I said earlier, to get people trained up, get new people in place. At that same time, Martin was also going through some things where their guitars weren't, it wasn't their greatest time. They were making some great guitars, as were we, but that's when Bob Taylor really jumped in. In the 90s, introduced a new style of guitar that the young players just loved. It was not traditional like a Gibson or a Martin, and the young players said, oh, that's cool. That Gibson's more like my grandpa's guitar. I like this, this new Taylor thing, and, and it worked. And he built a great guitar. He built new techniques to build the guitars more consistently, more cost-effectively, all wonderful stuff. And, you know, and we felt it. We felt that you know, we had kind of lost that young buyer. So we introduced a new guitar called the, it's now called the Songwriter, which, like I said, those of you that have been around guitars, you know what it is. It's been out for a while now. And at first, our company ownership didn't like it because they thought we were kind of apologizing for our history. And, but then they saw that it really worked well, and it's become a strong point of our line. It's the only guitar we make with a cutaway. That's, that's part of our core line. And uh, we also make it with or without the cutaway. But so if you see that guitar, it doesn't really look like a historic Gibson. That's where that came from. It was kind of just to have something different for that modern player. Now, it's, it's so funny because over the years, those of you, anyone here see the CMA Awards a few weeks ago when they were on TV? What kind of, what kind of acoustic guitars did you see 99% of the time on the stage? Gibsons. The young players have come back to us, the young rockers, the young country guys, and just, we're just killing it right now, and in that market specifically. But it's, uh, it's fun again. It's fun again. The young players are realizing that they like that sound. That's what it's all about is the Gibson tone. So we've talked about the line. We've got small bodies, square shoulders, slope shoulders, the super jumbos. Let's talk a little bit about what we're doing utilizing technology. There's a few things that we're doing now that will make the guitars more consistent, make the guitars better without compromising any of the historic nature of the build that we talked about. I explained this a little bit last year, I believe, but anyone here know what a Plex machine is? Anyone heard of that, that ter terminology? It's not new. We've uh, Taylor, Martin, Gibson Electrics have been using them for quite some time, uh, other builders. We just recently started doing this last year, 2014. It's a machine, it's like the size, of, imagine two phone booths side by side. Take the guitar with no strings on it, you put it in this machine. It actually makes the neck feel like, or puts the neck in a position that replicates that it has string tension on it. So it's like the guitar is strung up to pitch. It analyzes the neck, It has a sensor that goes down and it measures the width of the nut and then it measures the width of the fingerboard right here. So it knows exactly where all six strings are going to lie. Then it takes and it bounces under where every string is going to be over every fret and it senses if a fret is a thousandth of an inch higher than the one before, a thousandth of an inch lower, goes back in and levels out all the frets, recrowns them, polishes them. Then it goes and slots the nut to the right height off the first fret so that playability up there is, is perfect every time. It cuts the saddle to the right height, does not dilute any of the hand-built factor of the guitar. It just makes the playability as consistent as possible. So when we send a guitar to Bailey Brothers, they can take it out of the box, put it on the wall, and know it's going to work. It just takes that, that human nature. Hand-built guitars are um, an amazing thing, but the human nature factor is always something you have to watch out for because people are people, and you have to... Keep an eye on people sometimes. It's Friday afternoon, it's late, they've been there 50 hours, you know, people get tired, you, so you have to kind of take that away from them to the point where the consistency does not come, inconsistencies do not come into play. The Pluck machine just makes the playability so much more consistent and it's, it's pretty much standard in the industry anymore ac across the board, all major manufacturers are doing it. We started doing it in 2014 and by mid-2014 we were plucking every guitar we made and to this day, every guitar is plucked. So playability is better. That was always one of our, one of the things that we heard about from end users and, and dealers is, you know, when you have people hand slotting nuts and hand working frets, they're not always the same. And, yes, sir? Do you mean, has an extra fret here or the, 
the reason, the, the tonal reasoning that some people like to have, and he, what he's asking about is some people, instead of the nut, actually have a fret right there, and then it arcs over the nut beyond that first fret. So you don't actually play be above it, but it's a metal fret just like these in that first position. The reasoning that people sometimes think that that is a, an advantage is when you strum a guitar open, or when you play, an, uh, say, a G chord, you have some strings that are going over metal, some strings that are going over plastic, the open strings are bone. When you have that zero fret nut, even the open strings are being affected by metal, by a fret. So in some people's minds, it gives a little bit more consistency between the fretted strings and the open strings tonally. I myself have never been able to hear really hear that difference. I have a pretty good ear. Uh, it's, it's not a bad thing, and it, there's really no negatives to it. I just don't think that it's a necessary step from my, from my personal standpoint. I don't, think that, I don't think the advantages for us to do something like that on our historic instruments, it would never fly with the general public. But um, it's, if someone wants to do that, there are no negatives to it whatsoever. So does that make sense about? Now, those of you that play electric guitars have heard probably some stories about some of the technologies that were put in some of the Gibson Les Pauls last year. They utilized the, the auto tuners, the G-Force tuners, it's called. Mixed results in the world, mixed opinions on whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. Henry, who owns the company, was uh, communicating with our general manager, and, and he said, you know, he goes, I do realize that the acoustic guitar buyer is, is a totally different animal than the person that buys an electric guitar, a lot more conservative, a lot more historic in a lot of ways. He goes, so I'm not going to make you use this new technology in all the guitars. He goes, that's not what your customer base wants. But, there was, there's always a but. He said, there are people out there that do appreciate and can use this technology Someone that plays in a lot of multiple tunings on a given night, if they use, you know, go from standard tuning to open G to dad gad, you know, and, and they don't want to have to bring five guitars to the gig or spend half the night tuning. And he said, so I, I would like you to use this technology in a few models. So we do have a couple guitars that we just released to the market called the Progressive Series. And they do utilize that technology. They do have the G-Force auto tuners on them, which work really well. No matter what you read in the forums and people that are traditional Gibson people, don't, in some cases don't like them because they're not what they remember, they're not the traditional thing, but they work really well. You hit a button and bam, you're an open G. You hit a button, you're an open D. And it just works. So we utilize that. Yes, go ahead. It's a robot. Each tuning machine has a servo motor in it. And it actually has a sensor, kind of like a, like a snark tuner that you plug on to hook onto the peg head. Each tuner has like that built into it, so it senses the vibration for that string. And you just strum through it, and, and all six strings tune up. Much, much better. Number one, the intonation is, is so much better. Number two, they're lighter. Number three, you can manually tune them yourself. And just they have a lot of functionality that like when you're stringing it up, you hit, hit the button twice and you hold it down and it, it winds it. You don't have to sit there and, and do this. So they've, they've taken what we have heard from the, from the field as people's concerns and what they didn't like about it and made it better. So the new generation G-Force tuners are the best ever and they actually do work really well. We're not going to say that for everybody. We're not going to say that we're going to put them on 200s and 45s and, and, and force the technology on people, but the but they are out there, and it's a cool thing, and, and I'm sure eventually Keith will get one in here once we get start shipping more of them, and if you get the opportunity to check it out, it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. They're a little bit smaller. They're still, you know, a little bit bigger than the Grover body back, but Wes says he has, if you go, if you go out in the bus, he can she can show you some out there on, on a guitar out there, so. And, and also, before you leave, if you have not been in the bus, check it out. It's, it's pretty cool. We, we love having, having Wes. Thank you, Wes, for bringing the bus in from Nashville so we get the chance to hang out. And so. But Gibson Acoustics, we've been, like I said, it's been a long road since 1894. The guitars have been built as guitars since the mid-20s. We feel right now we're building the best guitars we've ever made, and we're just going to keep building them. We love feedback. We love hearing from people like yourself, what we can do to make it better. We're going to continue to make them historically. We're going to continue to stick to our guns. 
And, and as I said earlier, we hope we never have to compromise how we build the guitars. And as of right now, it's going so well for us, I don't think we will. We will be here all day. We have a full Gibson team here. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. I'd love to have you come in and try out some guitars. Make sure you get signed up for the coupons. And uh, yes, Danny. Yeah. Oh, I forgot all about this one. I hired Danny to help me. Just a guitar that is kind of new to Gibson. Yeah. A few years ago, we were tasked by Henry, our owner, to delve into what were considered lower price points than, than we traditionally had been at. The J45 had always been kind of our, I'm, I'm going to use the term loosely, entry-level guitar, because we know they're still not inexpensive. But for us, that was always kind of like the starter model for a lot of people, kind of just the bare bones Gibson. We uh, did a guitar called the J35 for a couple of years, and Keith has a couple in there that were just wonderful, wonderful guitars. I think they had a street price at that time of uh, $17.99, which for a handmade North American-made guitar wasn't bad. Henry asked us, he said, beginning a uh, going into last year, he said, we need to do better. You need to find a way to make a guitar and do it profitably at $14.99 street price. So we looked at it and went, okay, how can we do this without compromising how we build these guitars? What are, what's, what are the most expensive parts of the guitars? Number one is materials. A lot of you are familiar with our history, with our situation with the federal government and when they did the raids on the plants and, and confiscated the woods and such. And so these days we take a lot of time and spend a lot of money verifying the sourcings of our woods, verifying the, the validity of the paperwork and everything else. And it's expensive to do that. And one of the ways that we were able to get this guitar onto the market without having to do all that was it's all North American tone woods. We thought if we use all woods from North America, we don't have to import the woods, we don't have to worry about the paperwork. So we started the J15. Walnut, back and sides, fingerboard and bridge. Walnut is, you know, acoustic guitars traditionally have been rosewood, maple, and mahogany, the big three. Probably 90, 90 plus percent of guitars made over the past 50 years were those three woods. But walnut is getting more and more popular. A lot of builders are using it. It's a very sustainable wood. The walnut trees in California, when they get so old, they quit bearing fruit, they just cut them down and replant. So it's a natural process um, of availability of the wood. They don't cut it down to build guitars. They cut it down as part of the agricultural process and then the wood is available. So it's very uh, ecologically friendly. Spruce top from Alaska. Now the maple neck is something we normally put on just higher end guitars, like 200s, doves that type of thing. But again, we wanted it to be all North American wood, so we put a maple neck on this guitar, which is a wonderful upgrade for a guitar that comes in at $14.99 for a handmade North American-made guitar. It's the best value on the acoustic guitar, North American acoustic guitar market today. And just playing simple stuff so you can just hear the guitar, not me. What I would ask is if you are in the market for an acoustic guitar and you have a budget that's maybe not quite to where you can go to some where some of these guitars are, at least give this one a shot. This is a guitar that at this price point, again, it's the best value on the acoustic guitar market today. Danny will attest to that. And we just, we can't build enough of these. We did just, they're selling like crazy worldwide. It's not a traditional Gibson guitar, but it's just working. And I think people really do see the value in this guitar. It comes with a pickup. Nice abalone rosette, tortoiseshell pickguard, Grover tuners, $14.99 street price. Wonderful, wonderful value for, for, for a handmade guitar. Thank you, Danny, for reminding me of that. Any questions on the Gibson acoustic guitars, on how they're built, our history, our model lineup? You guys, I appreciate you sitting through the, the visit today. We will be here all day. We have some swag in there. Make sure you grab yourself a T-shirt and uh, just enjoy your day. We're here. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Don't go away. I have something for all of you.